It is hard for me to understate what the Resident Evil series has meant for gaming. In the early days of the PlayStation 1, it served as an example of new places games could go, birthing the entire survival horror genre. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. We need to address the elephant in the room. It is true that Alone in the Dark predates Resident Evil by four years. Both games feature a horror setting, tank controls, pre-rendered backgrounds with dynamic polygonal characters, and puzzle-based gameplay. Still, Resident Evil demonstrated a much higher level of production value and success. Let's start from the beginning. What is Resident Evil? Resident Evil is a horror-themed game where you play as one of two elite police officers investigating a series of murders outside of the fictional Raccoon City. The game places the player in a mansion filled with zombies and other monsters. You solve simple puzzles to try to figure out the mystery of how the dead walk and just try to get out alive. The most contentious argument made against the classic that is this game is its control scheme. The game utilizes the so-called tank controls. This means that the player's character moves relative to the character's orientation, not the player's view of them. Pressing up on the controller moves the character forward, regardless of which direction they are actually facing. The character can be rotated to change their direction, allowing the player to navigate the environment but rotating the character is a tedious process, which you can lose precious seconds while fighting various monsters trying to make lunch of your neck. Control scheme was necessitated, however, by the use of static 2D backgrounds, combined with the cinematic viewpoints. As your character runs off the edge of a particular viewpoint, the camera angle changes, often to a drastically different perspective. The tank control setup keeps the character moving in the same direction relative to themselves, allowing for more coherent control. This isn't without its problems, however. Your character is not very agile. An inexperienced player may find themselves repeatedly running into walls and missing doors as their character face plants into random objects. This also means that avoiding zombies and the like can become difficult, meaning that avoiding combat might not be an option for some players. I contend that the controls are not nearly as bad as detractors say, as a Resident Evil veteran, almost none of these problems present for me. There are numerous enemies in the game that I don't feel the need to kill. Even knowing that I have to repeatedly run past this zombie, I know it can avoid damage well enough that it isn't worth the bullets. Still, boss battles are unavoidable. When stuck in small spaces with an oversized snake or whatever, it can be frustratingly difficult to avoid damage. It would have been nice if greater care had been placed by the developers to avoid letting boss battles frustrate the players by playing on the weaknesses of the tank control scheme. Still, true boss battles are somewhat rare in this game, and not all of them have these problems with them. Plant 42 and the first encounter with the Tyrant are notable examples of boss battles where I wouldn't call this an issue. Where it becomes a true problem is with the battles with the Yawn, the snake monster, the giant spider in the cave, and the second battle with the tyrant. As mentioned before, the game utilizes a combination of 2D and 3D graphics. The backgrounds are all static, pre-rendered graphics, while the characters are polygonal 3D assets with dynamic animations and texture mapping. This allows for both the background and character assets to remain high detail at the same time. This was mind-blowing for me at the time. Resident Evil was the first PlayStation game I had the pleasure of seeing in action, and it completely changed my perspective on what games could be. I didn't understand the technology at the time, but it seemed impossible to me. You have to understand the place where we were at the time. Compare this to Alone in the Dark, the closest comparison I could find. The difference is obvious, but it's even more significant than that. Alone in the Dark was a PC game, a platform I didn't have. 
The closest comparison I could come up with at the time was to cinematic SNES games like Flashback. Quaint as it may seem now, Resident Evil was revolutionary. Then of course, there is the voice acting. Oh boy, the voice acting. The voice acting was, or at least should have been, as mind-blowing as the graphics were. Previous games I had experienced only managed to have voice acting or voice synthesis in very short clips. It was in place more for the wow factor of their presence rather than an actual substantial part of the game. Resident Evil changed that. The characters were fully voiced. I just wish they were voiced better. The script, direction, and voice acting itself are all terrible. This was immediately obvious, even to the childhood version of me. It's so bad I am unsure what the problem actually is. The script has more cheese in it than the Taco Supreme. I doubt Daniel Day-Lewis could deliver the line, You, the master of unlocking, in a way that wouldn't elicit giggles. It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. Thanks. Maybe I'll need it. Still, what, oh, oh no, was another overly cheesy line. What? Oh! Oh no! But one that was good enough that an actor that was skilled enough could have delivered it better. It's easy to blame the actress for this, for what may have just been poor direction. I can totally imagine the director not giving the actress any idea of the context for the line. One thing is for sure, the director didn't seem to notice how bad the delivery was, because it wasn't re-recorded until acceptable. The game's puzzles tend to be rather simplistic compared to contemporaneous puzzle games such as Myst. Resident Evil puzzles typically revolve around finding keys or key-like tokens to open new areas up to the mansion. The challenge inherent in these is not solving the puzzle itself, but navigating the mansion and finding the pieces needed to progress while fighting the monsters that block your path. I never found these puzzles inherently challenging, but because they force you to explore more of the game world, they may force an unknowledgeable player into more hostile encounters than is absolutely necessary to complete the game. That brings us to combat. Combat is somewhat hampered by the control issues mentioned earlier. Depending on the version of the game, you may or may not have auto-aim assist. With auto-aim, targeting enemies is no trouble at all, and since you are unlikely to be swarmed by enemies, you rarely run the risk of auto-targeting enemies that are not your intended target. Without the auto-aim, it can be difficult to accurately judge the angle required to line up a shot with the enemy making firing on distant or off-screen enemies nearly impossible. This problem seems to be limited to the original run of the North American release of the game. The various director cuts of the game feature auto-aim intact. The game does a fantastic job of giving the player a limited feeling of empowerment. You are provided with several weapons. The pistol works well enough against zombie humans and zombie dogs, but falls short for stronger enemies. Shotgun, bazooka, and magnum are needed for and are more than a match for the hunters and bosses. There is a flamethrower exclusive to Chris Redfield's playthrough, but it's only available for a limited time. However, these weapons have limited ammunition. Balanced about as well as one could expect for a game in the 90s, you are provided with just enough ammo to fight off the enemies, but not enough to truly feel like you're in control of the situation. For an experienced gamer on their third or so playthrough, it doesn't feel like such a restriction. Knowing where to find all the ammunition leaves you awash with firepower. For me, the biggest challenge is deciding on when it is no longer necessary to carry older weapons. The knife is useless from the start, the pistol isn't necessary after you're done with your second visit to the Spencer Mansion, and for Jill at least, a shotgun can be disposed of while exploring the lab. 
All in all, it does seem like the game provides you with more than enough ammo to eliminate every enemy in the game. But, for the first time player, you are either unlikely to be skilled enough to efficiently dispose of all the monsters, and or unlikely to actually find all the ammunition available to you. Similar to the limit ammunition, you are limited in your ability to save by the ink ribbon system. You are only able to save your game at fixed points on the map. You need both access to a typewriter and an ink ribbon, which is held in your inventory. The ink ribbon is consumed on use, then this limited use of saves prevents you from abusing the save system. By saving each time you cross a typewriter and repeatedly reloading every time something doesn't go your way. I've never found this to be an overly tight restriction on the player. Even in my first playthrough, the inconvenience of having to retrieve an ink ribbon from the item box is more of a problem than the limited number of saves available. The game offers the use of two main characters, Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine. Both characters have some significant differences between their playthroughs, but overall, it is the same game. You encounter the same enemies in the same locations, and the overall story doesn't change. What does change is the available side characters, weapons, and minor changes to puzzles. These changes add up to the point of making Jill Valentine's playthrough noticeably easier than Chris's. I think the developer intended to make Jill and Chris balanced, but just didn't pull it off. Jill has a number of advantages. In a game with limited inventory space, Jill can carry 8 items, while Chris can only carry 6. Jill has a lockpick, which doesn't take up any space in her already expanded inventory, which allows her to unlock sword key doors as well as small key desks. Chris not only has to find these keys, but has to carry them around in his more limited inventory space. Jill also has the potential to gain access to the shotgun without completing the broken shotgun puzzle, thanks to Barry. She can also complete the piano puzzle and Vigil puzzle without the need of Rebecca's help. Jill also has the advantage of the enormously useful bazooka with its multiple types of ammunition. Chris doesn't have this weapon, instead having access to the flamethrower. The flamethrower itself is a useful weapon, but it is only available for a short period of time and has to be left behind in the underground passage to unlock doors. So what advantage does Chris have? I can confirm that Chris does in fact have more health than Jill. Using a memory scanner on an emulated PlayStation, I can observe the health of the two characters in their raw data form. Chris has a maximum health of 140, while Jill only has a max of 98. This means that Chris has 42.9% more health than Jill. Chris can take more hits and keep on going, while Jill would have been left a corpse on the floor. There is also a difference in movement speed. Running the characters side by side, I can confirm that Chris does in fact run and walk slightly faster than Jill. But when I say slightly, I mean slightly. While the running speed is negligible, the health issue is not. Still, the advantage doesn't offset the myriad disadvantages that Chris has under Jill. The story of the game is rather basic, but it serves its purpose. While the game features a fully voice acted script, it is through the various journal entries dispersed through the game world that the backstory of the game is revealed. This has the downside of potentially cutting off players that don't have the inclination to read, or simply never find the text entries. Personally, I consumed the story with enthusiasm. Every journal entry gave me another piece of the puzzle, figuring out the mystery of why the dead walk. Still, it isn't long into the game before you understand that the zombies and the other such monsters are the result of a lab experiment that had gotten out of control. Zombies being the infected employees of the Umbrella Corporation. The small twists in the story, such as Wesker betraying stars, are rather obvious by the midpoint of the game. And this story would be expanded rather greatly in the sequels, 
but the first game does lay a solid foundation for the rest of the series. Resident Evil is not the best in the series. Later games would expand on what was accomplished here with more interesting puzzles, story, and expanded gameplay. Still, Resident Evil's the game I keep coming back to when I want that classic Resident Evil fix. Maybe that's because the game isn't very long. An experienced player can complete the game in a few short hours. An inexperienced gamer, not really that much longer. While creating this video, I began to wonder, if I would care about this game if I didn't have that strong nostalgic pull toward it. Maybe I didn't play or see this game until after Resident Evil 2 graced us with its presence, but I still feel the same way. I doubt anybody raised in the stylings of Resident Evil 4 can truly appreciate what the original did. Even the remake released on the GameCube puts the original to shame in many respects. That is why nostalgia is so important. Very few games of this era managed to hold up well in modern comparisons. Everything from Resident Evil to Mario 64 are dependent on our warm and fuzzy feelings of the past to sustain our happy, happy thoughts about them, which is why it is important to keep things in context. Sure, Resident Evil is a clunky mess with awkward loading screens, cheesy voice acting, and predictable story, but maybe it is because of these faults, placing us firmly in our thoughts of the past, that is its true strength. What is it?